Good for me. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the third of four webinars in this series. We're celebrating the 40th anniversary of URISA's Exemplary Systems in, G in Government Awards, or as we call them, EC. At the end of this presentation, we'll give you a link to the final and upcoming webinar. My name is Nicole Dogan. I work at the town of Plough Mound, where I'm a senior GIS analyst. Today, we're going to hear from the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, PG Atlas, which was an eSig winner in 2010. After the presentation, we can take questions or if you feel the need to ask during, you can also put comments into the chat box. Firstly, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. They are Michael Sheehan and Jason Salmon. Michael is the Planning Department GIS Supervisor for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission located in Prince George's County, Maryland. His primary responsibilities are the oversight of the enterprise base layers, the development of new applications, training, and providing guidance on the future direction of GIS within the department. Mr. Sheen is an active member of the Maryland State Geographic Information Council, committee, sorry, was an appointed member of the Maryland Integral Map MD IMAP Executive Committee, and was a member of the Federal Geographic Data Committee, FGDC, and the White House Y2K Assessment Team. Mr. Sheehan has also worked for the National Association of Counties, has provided consulting services for two defense contractors, and served two tours in the US Navy. Mr. Sheehan received his undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland, and his graduate degree from John Johns Hopkins University. Jason Samus is the National Service Line Project Program Manager for EA's Information Technology Service. Mr. Samus has over 20 years of experience guiding organizations through the business analysis, design, development, and implementation of enterprise applications. Additionally, Mr. Samus serves as EA's Technical Chief for IT, Data Management, and GIS services. I just lost my place, sorry. And is responsible for the overall QA, QC program for those services. For the past eight years, Mr. Samus has served as project manager for EA's contract with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commi Commission to provide hosting, maintenance, and support for pgatlas.com. The Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission was a distinguished award winner to the Enterprise System category in 2020 for the PG Atlas. Thank you, Michael and Jason, for being here. I'm looking forward to seeing your presentation. Take it away. Great. Well, thank you again for that great introduction. Um, I got to say hello to everybody again and good afternoon or good, ap good, good, good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, again, well, my name is Mike Sheehan. I'm here with my colleague, Jason Samus, and this afternoon, we'd like to give you a tour of the PG Atlas web application that is now over 20 years old, that serves the citizens of Prince George's County and also um, uh, throughout the world. So today, um, what I want to do first is thank the ERISA board and the executive committees for nominating us. Um, there has been a lot of work and uh, effort put into this. And along with our, our, our um, joined at the hip consultants, we keep building on this and I'm really excited to show you what we've done. So let me begin first here with a, this, uh, an agenda. That didn't work. And now it's going to the last page. That didn't work. There we go. That's gonna work. All right, so the agenda. So the background, first we're gonna do a little bit of background. I wanna talk about who we are, where we're from, kind of give you a sense of um, um, kind of what our organization does. So it kind of sets the stage of the history that led to the development of PG Atlas, the current infrastructure, which my colleague Jason will then talk about. And then we'll end up with benefits, some of the benefits we've found along the way, how it's expanded and what we learned. So the background, first Prince George's County, it surrounds um, Washington DC. For those that know, it's right along here is Washington DC has a population of 908 
thousand people, but you know, a little over almost 500 square miles. And the census reports a median household of 84,920. And they meet anybody that drives the Washington, D.C. traffic knows that 37.3 minutes is optimistic. So that's what they say. So I'll leave it with that. Talk about the Prince George, talk about the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So we are a bi county agency, we, uh, we cover both Prince George's and Montgomery County. So I am speaking on behalf of Prince George's County. Our office is located here in Upper Marlboro. Our executive office is in Riverdale, Maryland. And we also have offices for the Montgomery side. It's in a transition between Silver Spring and their new headquarters. So I left it at Silver Spring. Just to give you a sense of, of who we are, population of 908,000 for Prince George's County, there are five states that have less people than just our county. So with that comes an enormous amount of, of uh, effort, resources, uh, people. There's lots of things that have to be managed and the demands for the tech corridor of the Washington DC area is great. So it continues to be, we continue to be challenged and pushed to the envelope to give the citizens what they deserve. Give you a little background. So we're slightly different than most county planning departments because we were created by the Maryland General Assembly in 1927 to operate public parks and provide land use planning for both Prince George's County and Montgomery County, Maryland. Prince George's County has the additional responsibility to operate the public recreation program. So I'm speaking on behalf of the Prince George's County Planning Department and we're going to talk about the PG Atlas application just to make it clear, because it can be a little confusing. So I want to give you a sense of our the number of employees and our budgets. This kind of gives you an idea of the size of our county between Prince George's and Montgomery County Park and Planning. And this gives you a sense of the Prince George's County government. So typical county government, there are, they have 7,364 employees and the planning department has 1,100. So I'm going to talk a little bit about his, the history of PG Atlas. So this is the general interface for pgatlas.com. It has remained that way for over 20 years. But before we dive into this and start giving you what all the tools it offers and how we got there and where is it going, I think we need to step back and talk about what it looked like as we walked into this digital age. It's when I first started was like in the uh, late 1990s. So back then, for uh, anybody that's new to the field, this is look very foreign to you. These are Mylar maps. And because our uh, the planning department was responsible for property, zoning, and address authority, we had to then, ma then manually map this information. So this was a very tedious, time-consuming effort where there were 1,330 of these half sheets that had to be manually done by draftsmen with pen and ink. So there were a total of 3,960 of these sheets that had to be maintained just for the property zoning and the address maps. So there are 65 years of just capturing all of this information on Mylar. So what did that look like? So the, all of this information was all over the department, different buildings, different data sets, maps had to be recreated with pen and ink at different buildings. So you had them slightly out of order. There wasn't really no one master data set. We had the state of Maryland, which was capturing the parcel data at a much larger uh, geographic area. The engineers were bringing in plats at a different level and all of that was stored in different map cabinets throughout the, throughout the different buildings. So we have one, one sheet for the actual WSSC grid. You can see how people were actually writing on the map with permit numbers. This is the way we did business. They also were using, this This was our road network. It was a public document was from the ADC map people. We would rely on that to actually figure out where the streets were and the highways, the parks. That was our data source. People were pulling out historic maps. This is an 1861 map. They wanted to see this information on top of another map at a different scale and another scale. So it got really, you know, very difficult to kind of align it all together. 
And then along the GIS world started. So back in uh, 1985, five, five agencies got together. You have Montgomery County, Prince George's County government. You have park and planning on both sides, Montgomery and Prince George's. And you had the uh, WSSC, which is our um, uh, Waste and Water Sewer Sanitation Commission. So all together, we all got together and agreed on pooling our resources to take advantage of some of this uh, streamlining information and present it in a way that we all could benefit from it. That resulted in this um, GeoMap agreement, which then led to further documentation of actually the first attribute table of the planimetric data set, which then happened in 1991. Which I find interesting is that this is 1990, this is the property attribute data set, and it's typed by a manual typewriter. So you can kind of see how the, the transition to a digital world was happening all at the same time and we captured it. Now, what does this mean? So this is the chart highlights the uh, evolution of the SRI software. We're in the very beginning stages here, back when ARC Info 6 was the main script language that we were using to develop the data. And then, then ARC, um, ARC View 3.0 was out at the same time. And the challenge was we were no longer going to maintain those Mylar maps. So how are we going to present this data in a way so that the average staff member could use it? Well, at, at that time, it was going to be, it was going to be ArcView 3.0, but it was, you know, not everybody had a computer on their desk and everybody was still dealing with dial-up modems and the bandwidth was very slow. It was really hard sell to get people to be trained on, on, on ArcView at that time. And on top of it was the cost. And at that time, we, were, we had to purchase 160 licenses. That was 192,000, and not everybody had a license. This was not sustainable. We had to find another solution. So at that time, ArcIMS popped up. About the year, December 2000, ESRI approached us and said, hey, we have this new internet mapping application. I seriously had doubts. I mean, again, we were dealing with dial-up modems. If you remember back then, the imagery would draw really slow. And I, I was like, this, this, this sounds great, but way too early in the process. They convinced us. We built one internally. We weren't sure how, how this, this is before Google Maps. Google Maps started in 2005. So we were struggling to figure out how to interact with a web map back then. And so you could see our tech guys are using green text and it, it wasn't colored, it wasn't laid out real well. We just wanted to see how it would work. Well, we were surprised. As soon as I started showing staff, this was all intranet based only and it was performing pretty well intranet wise. So we started letting people look at it. They started asking more questions and sure enough, the citizens started looking over their shoulder and said, how come I can't do that at home? So now we're in November of 2002. This is the first pgatlas.com application. It went to the public and we said, here, you know, let, let's see how this works. So we presented it to the public and it exploded. People started wanting more and more and more. So here's the November of 2003 version. We started getting into color contrast issues, font size issues, which I'll talk about later on but those all became very new to us. Web development, mapping, it was all coming at us at the same time. And then June of 2007 was our development activity data set, where the planning board, where we're Prince George's County Planning Department and we support the planning board. Every subdivision development that comes through Prince George's County goes through a review process. That information historically was always captured in a database Everybody wanted it on a map. They wanted to see where it was. They wanted to zoom to it. So that pushed us to build the first development activity data set. That resulted in the next version, December of 2009. Now we're getting into dividing the application into subcomponents. Everybody referred to this as more of the main application that you really got trained on and started using it, but there was so much information requiring training that we started dividing it into little pieces. So they had little sub applications for the first time. Then we got into the Google age and Google, Google uh, 
a- Apple phone, I'm sorry, Apple phone came out with the big icons and everybody was excited about that. And they said, we need to break those applications of PG Atlas into sub components and make it very clear that you're clicking on something to open. And that results to where we are today. So as of December, December, October 2015, the browser that we're about to talk about hasn't significantly changed. And my colleague Jason will now talk about how we how we move forward from here. And Jason, you're up. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you all for participating today. Um, since about 2013, uh, EA has had the, the privilege of hosting the PGS.com uh, application for the commission. And I've been serving as the project manager. Um, for that effort. Uh, as Mike mentioned, I guess, in his last slide there, the, the current version of uh, the pgatlas.com interface uh, is written in the Esri JavaScript API. It was you know, initially migrated from a Silverlight application in uh, 2015, uh, which was you know, used to, to provide some additional capability you know, in that iPhone area that, that Mike was talking about. Um, since 2015, uh, the uh, interface has been relatively stable in terms of changes from the, the, the infrastructure perspective, but there've been lots of other, I guess, enhancements made to the system overall. Um, in 2017, a development activity notification platform was introduced uh, to provide the public the ability to register to receive a weekly digest um, via email of uh, updates to all the development activities within uh, Prince George's County. Um, within the email, as you can see there in one of the screenshots, it's some basic information about the activity, but it provides a link uh, to PG Atlas, to, uh, which then ultimately does the search for that particular case and provides the, the history and full detail for that particular case uh, within the, the application itself. In 2018, the system was migrated to where it currently sits today uh, within Amazon Web Services cloud infrastructure. Uh, there are really two primary reasons, I guess, for that migration. One was to ensure that the system was hosted within a redundant, reliable you know, 365, 24-7 environment as its uh, use was in, uh, increasing and was you know, used basically on a 24-7 basis, as I'm sure Mike will talk about in a little bit. The other goal for that migration to uh, AWS was to serve as, a, at the time, an initial pilot for the commission of establishing, you know, a, a footprint, if you will, within the cloud and managing applications there with a future goal of bringing other applications and systems, you know, into that cloud over time. Also in 2018, uh, there was an integration with pictometry.com directly into the, the interface uh, to provide access to uh, the wealth of I guess, aerial photogrammetry that pictometry provides uh, from both historical and current perspective, um, accessible for very specific locations within the county. So a user has the ability to drill into an individual property or area and access uh, the library of pictometry.com imagery available for that location. Likewise, same concept in 2019, we applied that for Google Street View uh, to provide the same level of integration where a user can pull up the current Google Street View scenes or panoramas uh, for a particular uh, property or location uh, within the county directly from the pgatlas.com interface. And then most recently in 2020, a mobile version of pgatlas.com was introduced uh, to provide the public access to the wealth of property information within the, the application, but from a mobile device. Uh, the, the anticipated sort of use case or scenario for this would be you know, an individual uh, member of the public would be sitting in front of or standing in front of, if you will, a, a particular property or parcel and using uh, the GPS within their phone to very quickly pull up all the property information uh, for that particular property or parcel within PG Atlas on their device. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. In terms of the architecture and technology behind the system, uh, this slide sort of represents where we are now. Uh, there are three primary components of the application. Uh, there's the UI, user interface, which as we said here in a couple of different slides is based off of Esri's ArcGIS API for JavaScript and a lot of Angular JS to provide a lot of uh, data views and tabular views of information. Uh, in terms of the database supporting the, the system, it's, it's an Oracle-based uh, RDBMS. And from a GIS perspective, it's Esri's ArcGIS server. Um, so really a th uh, three pieces to the technology stack for the application. I've already mentioned you know, where it's currently residing within AWS. 
Um, and from a data updating perspective, the actual information is updated daily, uh, hourly, honestly, by the staff, uh, the planning department at the commission. Um, and that updated information is uh, sort of migrated to the pgatlas.com uh, database on a weekly and a monthly cycle uh, to ensure that the most recent information is available uh, within the application to the public. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. So where are we going next? Well, I'm gonna let Mike talk about probably the bigger picture items, but in the very near term, uh, we've got three specific activities uh, that, that we're looking at. Um, actually, about a month ago, we released a public address extract tool. So based off of the pgatlas.com uh, application and tool set, a very focused application to provide uh, the public the ability to uh, drill into a particular area within the county or enter an address and then to access uh, either property or owner addresses for all of the adjacent properties you know, within a given radius of their selected property and then export that data either in tabular uh, format in Excel or even Avery mailing labels. Um, this is sort of based off of a tool that the commission has been using for several years internally uh, for their planning department use. We are in the process right now of doing evaluation to modernize uh, the current version of the Esri JavaScript API um, for two primary reasons. One, the inevitable cycle of needing to keep uh, infrastructure up to date and up to pace with uh, the technology as they evolve, and also to allow for the implementation of 3D visualizations into the system in the future. A lot of data, a, lo a lot of information is now uh, being generated uh, that provides 3D capabilities. And we need to ensure that PG Atlas is able to present that information uh, to the public. And then finally, uh, we are currently in the process of doing an implementation of Cyclomedia's Street Smart tool, uh, street smart tool uh, within pgatlas.com. That's currently in a beta uh, test version within the, the commission itself, but will be released to the public, I'd say in the very near term, and it provides another source of uh, access to uh, scenes and, and uh, panoramas specific to very uh, to properties or, or addresses within uh, Prince George's County. So that's it for the, the near term and the, the current state. I'm gonna hand it back over to Mike to talk a little bit about the, the tool itself. Thank you, Jason. All right, so you're here to see PG Alice, so let's get to it. So here's the general interface to pgls.com. It's open to anybody. The, it's very flexible in web browsers. It is, um, it's been very stable and is very data rich. So with this pgatlas.com, we have 225 map layers embedded in this. And how this works. So what you can do is you, you have the option of going down to grouping. So we have the administrative grouping. If you were to click on the um, arrow next to administrative, it would expand and show you all of the different data sets within administrative. You then can say, hey, I want to turn on address point. So I could turn on address point and, and it will, what it can do is turn on the map and actually show you the metadata for that data set. So if you're not sure what you're looking at, what's address point mean? You can click on that and it will actually pull up the data catalog. The other piece of information here people would love to use is actually different ways of searching for the data. So you have the ability to search on property, you have grids, you have different um, municipality searches, you can search on landmarks, environmental features. So we'll keep it simple and say, let's just do a property search. So here I'm going to say enter 9400 Peppercorn Place it auto fills automatically. So because it recognizes it in the database, so you don't have to type it all the way out. You click search and two things happen. If the red dot appears, it means it's on our address point layer. It's the one that is right on the centroid of the building and it tells you where it's located. The other option is the blue outline. That is actually the property boundary, which is linked to the assessment database. So that also has an address. And in this, in this case, both are true. That way it highlighted both examples. Next, I want you to focus on tax account. There's a link for tax account, and there's also a link for plat information. All of this is a copy of the tax assessment database. All we do is get a copy of it once a month and we bring it right into place. 
but every once in a while, somebody wants to see the more current information. So this link will allow you to dive into it and actually look at the live database. Also over here, you have the Google Street View image that Jason had mentioned earlier. So this actually shows you without having to dive into Google, it actually shows you that view. You could click on that and it'll turn into just like Google Maps, you're looking at Street View automatically. And the other thing I'm gonna focus on here is all of these buttons. So you can export the data out as a PDF, you can save the data out as a spreadsheet. You have the pictometry link, which Jason mentioned earlier, we'll show that. The Google link, the Bing link, there's a lot going on here. So next, if I were to click on that uh, tax account link, this would open up the Maryland Tax Assessment and Mer Department of Assessment and Taxation database. It would show a live record of what that information is because our data can be a month old because we only get a copy from them once a month. The other thing we can do is the plats link. If the land is subdivided and you're interested in seeing more information about that that plat or that subdivided piece of land, what we have, we, this actually goes to Maryland State Archives. In State Archives, they scan every plat image into their database and they reference it on their website, plats.net. We were able to work with them and they gave us a way to pass PG Atlas into the database so that you can actually click on one of these links and what it will do is open up the engineering plat so you're actually looking at the legal document. It's a PDF. You can zoom in, you can email it, you can print it. It is, it is the, the official source of the engineering drawing that was used when that subdivision was built. This is an example of the Google Street View. I'm sure you've all used that. Again, you can interact with it, move it around. The Google link. Just like if you were to type in the address, it calls up all the information related that Google has about that property. The Bing link, the same way, just in case there's more information that we want to pull out. And the pictometry link. So this is, this is interesting. It's actually a screen on top of PG Atlas. The imagery is coming from Office of Information Technology, Prince George's County. Public safety funds this effort. And what this does is it's similar to bird's eye view, but a lot more tools. And what you can do is you can then rotate around north, south, east, and west, look at the building. You can zoom way in. And what's nice about it is you actually can go back in time and maybe look at what that property was in 2007. You also have the option of clicking on just the PDF. I just want the data for that address printed out save as a PDF, exports it out nice and clean, and now you can send that around to whoever you need to. This is the actual zoning map. Very colorful, lots of information. It's all attributed, so you can click on it and pull out a lot more information, but there's a lot of annotation on here. So we, when we maintain the property and zoning map now in a digital world, all of this is annotation, it's hand-placed so that it doesn't move. We needed to make sure it doesn't accidentally move to another source because people are using web maps. If the text slides over with auto labeling, they're gonna get the wrong information. They may not click on it and say, hey, what is this, it's CM. We need to be sure that they're getting the right information. This is actually our existing land use layer. This is a kind of a combination of multiple data sets, including the tax assessment database, some from the state of Maryland, some of our data. And what we're able to do is parse down and bring out you know, commercial data sets, office data sets and institutional. So it's like another, another example of how we can figure out what's happening on that land today. This is what I, I created this one just to kind of show you the different top topography data sets that are available. There's multiple years of uh, contours, two foot intervals. It's all LIDAR based, draped, very, very accurate. I've got the FEMA floodplain running up over here, the planimetric data sets of the streams, the buildings, the property lines we maintain. So it just gives you a nice feel of what you can create in PG Atlas. This is the home of the um, Washington football team. And what I wanted to show here is the archive of aerial imagery that we've collected over time. 
when I first started, there were file cabinets of nine by nine paper prints of aerial imagery, and nobody knew where they were. Some of them would be missing. And a lot of the staff didn't even know they existed. So what we had to do is I said, well, we need to pull all these out, go back to the source, get the negatives. And then we had a consultant glue all these together, rectify them, register them, got the RMS error down very low. And now we're able to actually take that imagery and say, we want to go back and look at it from 1993. So that's before the football stadium was actually built. We go all the way back to 1938, and then we have some of these 1861 Martinet maps and Hotkin atlases that are cartoons at best, but we register them and they do provide some value. You can always click on the question mark and get the metadata for it just to give you a sense of what's there. Next up is, again, we showed zoning earlier, but one of the troubles with zoning is that, of course, you're going to want to turn on imagery. So what we have is we turn on latest imagery. If you turn that on, you can now use the, the um, transparency bar. So the transparency bar can be brought back and you now you can see zoning over the aerial imagery. And again, that can occur on any of these layer groups. This is just the one that's most effective to show. Next up is uh, one of the things we'd often get questions on is this is great, but I need to add things to the map. I mean, I, I need to draw on the map. People think it's Photoshop. They think they can just, you know, write on the map. So, well, this, this is a web map. You're not supposed to go that far. We're not, we're not making professional publications here. So over time, we've been able to enhance our graphic tool design. And it's pretty crude, but it works pretty well if you know how to use it. And you can draw circles and make it transparency, add words, add leader lines. And all of that information can that then be saved. If you don't realize what you're looking at, this is the hangar for Air Force One on Andrews Air Force Base. Next up is the save feature. So as soon as people would say, I always zoom into this area, I do it every day. And if I open up PG Atlas, um, I have to close it when I go, go, to, go home for the night. I come in, I have to open it up, I gotta zoom in, I gotta turn all the layers on. Can you do something? So we started giving staff the ability to save the map extent, save the layer map name that they want to create, and also what layers were turned on. So now I just showed you what's in my inbox. I say, here's an address map I created, and I zoomed into this area. And if I had clicked on quality and development, I could have clicked on that. It would have changed the map and the view. It's like a save as. And this gives you another example of how you can draw text, you can draw lines, polygons, circles, you can do points and diamonds and X's. And again, it's, it's crude, but it's effective. And all of this can be saved. So once you type it out, you can create it, um, save it. And what, what I find is, of course, you know, you're at the end of the day and someone wants a map produced and you make this map and you create it, you print it out, they need two copies. What happens? You go home next day, oh, I need another one. Well, you hadn't saved it. Now you're trying to recreate what you did, which is nearly impossible. But if you had saved it, you could easily open it up and hit another copy, which has been very helpful to a lot of staff. Other things people wanted were the ability to me measure area and distance. So I'm giving you an example that I drew around here. It gives you how many square feet you can do you know, different measurement types, yards, you know, feet, miles. And I actually did linear distance here. So I just kept clicking along the road and it gave me a total of 105 yards from this point to this point. So who are our users? So that, again, remember we started building this in order for staff to be able to start using the information that we maintain in the house before it was Mylar Maps. How do they, how do they gain the information? So this web map was built for them, but as you'll see, it quickly was um, um, a lot of external users really wanted to put their input into this because they used it for their business models. So we have a lot of realtors using it for different reasons. Engineers and development, they're always looking for where the undeveloped land is. A lot of different citizen input and multiple government agencies from permits to health department, uh, board of elections, to set, um, 
Census Bureau, they're, they're all using it for different reasons. So the benefits. Well, Prince George's County, as I said before, is very large. And, if, and this map represents undeveloped land. It's where the assessed value is less than $15,000. So if the tax assessed value of the improvement value of that property is less than 15,000, it's in this orange color. There is a lot of potential for development. And again, we're right outside of DC. So there is going to be, there is a lot of push for um, further development within Prince George's County. What does that mean? All of that requires input in the development process. Our planning board members here have to review every subdivision case that comes in. The faster we get the information processed, consolidated and stored legally, the easier it is for everyone to review this information. What you're looking at here is this gentleman is looking at some of the maps that, are, that PG Atlas has created and is showing it up on the screen while people then can talk to the board and they can discuss the case. In this example, we're, we're actually searching on a development case. So if there is a new shopping center come in and they have a prefix of a special exception or a preliminary case or a detailed site plan, all of that information is stored in our development database. So down here, you're seeing actual case information from staff on where, they, where it is in the actual development process. I can click search, it will zoom right to that shape. Now you know where it's occurring in the county. I can now scroll down. You can look at lots and square footage. Is it multifamily or not? How many units? If I continue to scroll down, you can actually see the different actions going on for that. Different times the case has come up in front of the planning board. Different decisions are made. So this tracks the, all of that so people don't, uh, you don't have to go hunting for it. It's all together. And lastly, which is the one that's most, I think most important, is the documents that, uh, that go along with this case. So you have different options here to review what decisions have been made. I'll give you an example. Here's the actual engineering drawing that's attached to the preliminary, preliminary plan of subdivision. You may wanna see what, what, what does this look like? Again, anybody can see this. You also have all the different maps I'm going to talk about in a minute that actually are presented to planning board so a decision can be made. These are called sketch maps. Preliminary plan staff report, the actual staff report about a decision about the development, that's there. Planning board resolution. And now we're gonna roll into what the development review division does for PG Atlas. Now they use imagery, they use a lot of the data sets, but I had to point at, pull one out that I thought you might find interesting. And I think this is, this, this kind of says, how external users are using it, including staff. So we have an example, 9300 Baltimore Avenue. This is the Knights of Columbus right here. So I, as you can see, it's all parking lot. This place has been here for years. They've outgrown it. They really need to sell this and move on. So before they do, there's a problem. The back part of that property is residential and you can't have a parking lot in residential. So something's got to change. They can't sell the property until they get this result. So immediately, um, they, you know, they're like, well, hey, in 1967, the zoning ordinance was changed, requiring special exceptions for parking lots in R55 zone. Where is your special exception? Well, th this, this place is back in the 1920s. I mean, it, it's been there a long time. They didn't know. They had no idea how to, how to get that information. But when they started looking at PG Atlas, they realized that they could go back to the 1938 imagery and you can see the parking lot existed in 1938. Done. No, no special exception, no additional meetings, no additional fees. It was, it was decided, property could be sold. Why this is important, this is showing all the development cases over time. You can see the recession hitting, and now we're starting to see a large spike again of uh, cases coming in for approval and cases that are being processed. And all of that is gonna funnel into PG Atlas so people can then make the decisions they have to. 
permit, a pr permit approval process. Every planning, every permit that comes through has to be verified to make sure it's conformance to the zoning regulations and all of the environmental constraints. How do we do that? Well, in the past, again, it was a, a mix of different maps and different information, very time consuming. People would do photocopying, they'd make notes, they would do transpose errors. It, it was hard to do. PG Atlas today, they're sitting at their desk, they pull it up, everybody's looking at the same data set. You can be on the phone talking to the customer, they're looking at the same data set, no confusion, very seamless. There's a lot less errors, everything's digital. You can save these reports out as a PDF, no more mail, no more. It, it, just, it just fed the system very well. Permit review dashboard, Again, this is starting to show uh, how many permits we actually go through in the commissions. So you're like averaging about 3,500 a year. Here's, you can actually see COVID starting to hit and the number of permits dropping off. So every year we're processing 4,000 permits um, a, a, you know, a month. And so each one of those requires information out of PG Atlas to process. Environmental planning is what you would think. They look at a lot of the environmental like tree types, tree canopy, where, where is development occurring, trying to do estimation of popul population and property ownership. But what I, what I wanted to show you is something interesting. You think of Prince George's County and outside of DC, and one of the things you would think of is that uh, number of the development that's occurring is taking up a lot of the tree canopy. So there's a, this is a recent photo of an area of Prince George's County. As I drill backwards over time, you can see actually the acreage is decreasing because Prince George's County was a very big tobacco producer. So in reality, a lot of the area is actually getting much more tree canopy because we are no longer um, producing tobacco. And here's the property lines. I wanted to overlay that on top of it as well. Another interesting um, way PG Atlas was used, this is the home of Governor Odin Bowie back in 1826. It was actually a working plantation, 1300 acres. It had over 200 slaves. And there was a lot of pr pressure from the Rouse Fairwood development to actually start to purchase some of the land around this 1300 acres and use it for development. Historic Preservation uh, Commission well, you know, they were concerned about losing that, that uh, valuable resource of the past. So there had to be some compromises. So what we have here is this is the home of Governor Odin Bowie. Now the oral history for this property from a uh, grandson is that there were five buildings to the north that were actually where the slave quarters were, but nobody knew exactly where they were. So they, they were concerned that as development increased, it was starting to take over some of the land that they thought maybe the slave quarters were at. Well, during the Historic Preservation Committee meetings, people were using PG Atlas and they realized they saw something unusual on the imagery. And that's what I wanna show you next. They zoomed in and they started seeing, this is the house, over here is the house, and they started seeing this feature. So as you zoom in, you start going back in time, you start seeing this linear feature. And what I've been told is this is a very telltale sign of where um, homes would throw their waste back in the day. It was like certain distance away from their home. If this was true, maybe the slave quarters were nearby. So as they delved further back, this is 1938, you can clearly see this is an unusual feature on the land. Why am I bringing this up? because this resulted in a phase one archeological investigation saying if the development is going to continue, the developer is going to have to go in here and do some serious core analysis to find you know, what is happening in this area. And sure enough, they found the foundation for the slave quarters. And again, PG Atlas was the result of them having the information to make that decision and save that resource. Another option is you can search on a historic place. So this is Darnell Chance. You can do a search. It will call up this record. I can click on the green eye and it will actually bring up Darnell's Chance in the historic record for that property. 
Again, this is just all feeding based on user's input. It would be nice if, could you do this? So we keep collecting it, we keep modifying it to make it stronger and bigger. Public information. So this is our information counter. The public would come in and they'd ask for a wide range of topics. Everything from, can I build on this piece of property? How much acreage do I have? Is there a floodplain or slope on this? They get involved in mailing labels. So the, sit, the public information counter is a very strong uh, advocate of PG Atlas, as you can see there on um, right here on the screen. Now, why do I bring all this up? The feedback mechanism for PG Atlas is the success of this application. Without their feedback, we would never get to the next level. So we have our contractor, Jason, which is, you know, which is all joining with today, and our users. So the users say, I like this, I don't like this. It comes to us. We gather the requirements list. We go back to our contractor, say, can we build this? And it starts over. We have training that we offer two hours every, oh, every two or three months. We offer training to a group of 15 to 20 people over um, throughout the year. And they want to learn PG Atlas. They have new staff coming into the permits office. You have new realtors coming in. They need to be trained. So we're feeding that information um, stream as well. We also have beta user groups. And what we've done is as you're at training, you can actually start to hear individuals that have a real specialty, not only in technology, but they're, they're, they're a trade. So what I do is I handpick them to help me feed this loop. They are my beta testers. I will stand up a development site and send them the link and saying, hey, this isn't for public consumption, but I know you're good at this. Can you test this for me? And that has helped a lot. So expansion, where are we going? So what's happened is the public started saying, I need more than just PG Atlas. So up here in the top, there are four boxes. Advanced mapping is what opens, that's advanced mapping. But there are all these other versions of PG Atlas in here that allow the, allow the users to get even more information, refine it, um, drill down on specifics. So I wanna take a couple minutes and talk about that. Realtors, realtors are required. Um, any contract for the sale of residential real property within Prince George's County is subject to a tree conservation plan. And by, they are, the seller of the property must notify that there is a tree conservation plan on that property. So why is that problem? I got 30 acres I'm buying, I'm gonna build the biggest garage, the pool, whatever, but it's in a tree conservation plan. You can't develop any of it. So if they bought that property and didn't, were not aware of this, they could be liable. So the realtors are really anxious to get our information to make sure they're informing their public, that their clients, that the information is correct. So yeah, they, enter in, they enter an address, they hit search, it calls up, there's, there's not only a tree conservation plan one, but there's tree conservation plan two on this court. Over here, it's fine. That's how it works. So within Prince George's County, every time there's a development occurring, they put these signs up. You may, may have that in your jurisdiction, but you're driving, you're driving by, you don't have time to read it. It's really small font. It's hard to, you know, how do you write this down and remember it, call a number. I was approached by staff saying we can do a better job at this. And what we did is um, how do we take this information and make it much more accessible. You no, know, everybody's too busy to keep pace with all of this. How do we how do we make it easier for people at home to get that data? So what we did, I think Jason mentioned it earlier, is a development activity notification email where citizens can click and create a profile. What they do here is they can enter the zip codes they want to be notified of. And every time a new development case is entered into the development database, an email will be sent once a week with every one of those cases. So in reality, when that email comes in, here's an example of that email, there's a likelihood that, that staff haven't seen this yet and that the citizens are getting access to that information. So it, it, it's a win-win that we don't want bulldozers showing up and people say, I never was informed. This gets them the ability to not only see a summary of the case, but they can click on a map, call up PG Alice and see exactly what's going on. Develop notification, the app is it's taking off. As you can see, it keeps going up hundreds every, 
every year. Um, every time there's a spike, we keep thinking there's a newsletter that went out that says everybody has to sign up on this. We're not really doing any major uh, publications of this. We're not advertising for it, but we do we do mention it in newsletters. But so this has been very steady for a while. Next up is the planning board app. So what development is occurring? What, what will planning boards hear this week? What cases would I might be interested in going to planning board and, and actually participate in? So you can click on a certain week. The map will highlight where it is. You can then look at the case, click on zoom in. The map will zoom in. You're looking at PG Atlas and you have all the development information. So this is more of a, a, a poll. You can actually go in and look at it and see what's happening uh, in planning board this week. Next up is economic development. So we have a lot of requests from developers uh, for, you know, hey, can you tell me where in this example, improvement value from the assessment of less than $15,000 that has acreage footprint of five to 10 acres that happens to be within the city of Bowie that is residential zone. And so PG Alice will run out, grab those shapes and we'll draw the records here. You can export it out to Excel. You could zoom to each one if you prefer, but it's another way to get that level of data into the user's hands. So um, we don't have to do manual uh, requests. They can do it themselves. The other option is the address extract app that we talked about earlier. So uh, this is, you can see it a little bit clearer here is you can enter an address and zoom to it. I can now say, give me a radius of a uh, you know, quarter mile, click. Now you'll get all the properties selected. Now it's within a quarter mile. How do you want the information? Do I want a PDF of Avery mailing labels? Do I want the owner address or the premise address? Where do I want to send it to? And do you want the subject or email to say project one? You'll actually say generate the file. And what you'll see is this email come in and here are the Avery mailing labels, all formatted, ready to go as a PDF. Next up is the sketch map application. It's all again, leveraging PG Atlas. In this example, um, when a development is ready to go to planning board, uh, staff go in and enter that case number. And when they enter the case number, it will zoom in on the map and say, okay, here's the development under consideration. Are we ready? Do you wanna, do you wanna generate the map? Do you want to generate the images? You say yes, and what will happen is all of these maps will be created automatically as JPEGs so that they're ready for PowerPoint. You drop them in, and now staff can work on other things. Mobile application. This has been uh, growing in use. Uh, I think uh, once people realize um, that we we have both the uh, the 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 full-blown PG Atlas and the mobile app. Mobile app is just a scrape of what can be available. There, I don't, you know, it'll be a while before we have enough bandwidth to do what pgatlas.com does. But this does provide property zoning and some of that high level information the public needs when they're on the road. Surprises. So along the way through development, we ran into a few surprises. One being, again, this application was built for the staff. And that orange line at the bottom is staff. And what we found was the public dominated the use of PG Atlas. So it is all over the world. Um, I, I look at the web stats and I'm still impressed. Um, and so where is it going, how it's being used? And one fun example is we noticed the city in Sunnyvale, California was getting a lot of use out of PG Atlas. Like what, what's in Sunnyvale, California? Is this a university? So we, we tracked down the IP address. I sent the DBA an email saying, hey, can you help me out? You know, tell me, well, what are you doing? And he wrote back and he said, well, what we, we do is we're a title research company and we want a contract for Prince George's. So now we don't have to hire staff in, in the local area to go to the courthouse to pull the, the records that you show on PG Atlas. So they're just doing it from Sunnyvale, California. So again, it's a cost benefit for, um, businesses and, uh, and it just leverages, makes it stronger and stronger. We also find the police department is using PG Atlas when they approach a home, they wanna know who owns it. They like, you know, they want to gather as much information before they, um, 
expected before they interact with the public. We're also finding an interesting uh, use of the word PG Atlas. This is an engineering, engineering plat. If I were to zoom in on this area, you see that they're now actually adding the word PG Atlas to, a, in, to the engineering plat. That is the official record for that subdivision. So in 100 years, I hope they still remember what PG Atlas was, because if it changes names, we're not going to know what that is, which is interesting. We're finding developers are grabbing PG Atlas and using it as links to help sell properties within their website in their business. We're actually seeing Washington Post here is actually referencing PG Atlas in their news articles. And this was an interesting example of a very large church. I was approached by a, a, a pastor and the pastor said, Mike, I'm building this church and my altar has to be dead on east, facing perfectly to the, to the horizon. And I said, okay, so what do you need from me? And he said, well, I need the coordinates because I need to put this on the engineering drawing so there's no misunderstanding. So I said, okay, well, so I did the math and I presented it. Of course, he loved it. And then he told another pastor. And then that pastor called me. And I said, okay, we're going to build a way to put the coordinates in PG Atlas and that way they can get the information themselves. And that's what we did. You do Maryland State Plain Feet. You can do Lat Long, different types of coordinates. <clears throat> All right, so getting close to the end here. So this is University of Maryland College Park. Now why I bring this up is an well, interesting example is how PG Atlas is being used. I got a frantic call one afternoon from a professor that was having his master's um, ex final exam, and they were using PG Atlas as their exam. Well, that morning I did a complete rewrite and went to another version. So nothing looked like the other version. And he was frantic. He was like, I, I got to, I got to, you got to roll it back. And I'm, well, that's not that easy. I'm sorry. Um, and, and so that's why we tr continue to reach out to you know, different organizations that say, we could hold off for another day if it was that important. You just have to talk to us. So I'm sure many of you have faced this problem. Parks Department. So Prince George's County Parks, there's 25,000 acres of parkland, 551 parks, and they get a lot of requests for, you know, hey, you have a dead tree and you need to remove it. There's illegal dumping. All of this needs to be investigated. So they use PG Atlas to make sure that the property really is their property uh, and before they go out in the field and investigate. Why I bring that up when I approached them and asked, what is the, what is the most you know, unusual thing you do with PG Atlas? And it was beaver management. They receive 15 complaints a month where a beaver will go in and knock down a tree and it will flood the property, then floods the neighbor's property and creates damage. So they'll call um, the Park and Planning Commission and say, your land, your flood caused damage. So we have to send park rangers out investigate where the dam was. And sometimes we find that the actual dam was on somebody else's property because they have their iPad out in the field and they can check to see uh, what the truth is. Lessons learned. So when we did this, we had no idea about the American Disability Act. Some of the versions we, we started with, we, we were getting feedback about the font not being big enough, color contrast, visual disabilities, all of this, we had to get caught up on really quick. And, and so that, that is one takeaway um, that I offer is make sure that you're aware of this. When you start to make it available to all, make sure you are. PG Atlas training I brought up. Um, again, we do this in the training room. We are now virtual giving this training. Again, it builds support, gives us great feedback. People are very passionate when they're in class. They're looking at their problems. Or Mike, how can you help me with this? Do you have this data? Oh, you need that? Huh, I can do that. Let me add that to you. Oh, thank you, thank you. It builds alliances. It builds you know, um, trust. We're, we're really helping them out. And again, it's, it's all goodwill. Silverlight. 
that was one of our serious lessons learned. Silverlight came out, it was all flash and bang, and we couldn't wait to jump on board. We built it. Two months later, when we released it, Microsoft announces they weren't going to support Silverlight any longer. That caused a major pushback within the department. We had to get out of Silverlight that we just invested into and get into something more stable, which is where we are today with HTML5. So lessons learned, beware. And last slide, lessons learned. Uh, we're still looking for COTS products that we could rely on, where we could control updates, but I'm still finding they're very rigid. You know, they have their data model, but our, our staff and our public, they want the data a certain way. So we continue to explore those. There are several big leaders out there that, you know, we're looking at, but at the moment, HTML5 seems really stable and very happy, and we're very happy with it. Web browser updates, constant problem. So you have a Chrome does an update, all of a sudden there's tools and PG Atlas not working. You get the call. The customer's saying, I'm sorry, Mike, the app's not working. What browser are you using? Well, I'm using Chrome. What version of Chrome? What's the version? So we go through that. Then we start testing it and realize Chrome just did an update. And anybody with that version, it's not working. So now I'm working with our consultants to say, oh, great. Now, what can we do to fix this? What is it? So you have to keep track of all these web browser versions. The stakeholders change. And as I, as I showed you, over time, you, who you think your customer, customers are continues to change. Lately, it's been the health department with COVID, right? Everybody wants to know where, you know, where all of this is occurring. Elections is a big one, last election cycle. Where is the information? How can you help us? So the goal for us is a one-stop application that we don't have to keep modifying a lot so that people don't have to come back for training. It's important for us to show the information and keep it consistent as we migrate change because nobody likes to relive how to learn back. I used to do it that way. Now I have to do it that way. Nobody wants to do that. We do have an internal version and we, and we have had an internal version for years because we were never certain when you know Comcast might drop out or Fios would Verizon would have problems. It is our business tool. We, we have to have the app working. So we have an internal version and an external version. So the internal version, that's what staff mostly use. When we're talking to the public, we jump on the external one so that we're all on the same page. Everybody wants more. You give them a chance, they're gonna tell you that this is, you know, they're gonna like your app. They want you to build more, oops, sorry. And, uh, and so you have to be continue to be forward thinking. And also for me, it's management support. The more you can keep management involved in the process and build for them, the more successful these app will be. It's not cheap. And long-term for 20 years, it, it's, always on, it's always on somebody's mind. So I, I offer that to you is when you build these things, think about these questions. And with that it is the question and answer period. I am finished. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. That was excellent. Um, I'm gonna give a, since we're running kind of a little late. I'm just going to give a brief overview here for next week and then go straight into the questions and answers section. Um, Wendy has kindly posted links in the chat window about the 40th anniversary story map and application details and then about next month's the final 2020 eSig winner presentation next month which is um, Palm Beach County Water Utilities. There are still four weeks to complete your, complete your entries and submit them for this year's eSig awards. Submissions are due on or before June 7th. It's a pretty vigorous, rigorous award. So you need to plan ahead, um, and have all your paperwork together. There's no cramming the night before to get it in. It's quite robust. Um, this is just an excellent example of a really what this award is designed to accomplish. People in all manner of government can be honored and get the credit that they deserve for doing excellent GIS work. And now we'll move on to the questions. C. Pulford said, beautiful app, full of features, nice job. They have three questions. Besides bookmarking a location, can a user save the parameters of their search so that they can come back later? Yes, that, that is the bookmark. So. Um, when you 
First go into PG Atlas, you have the option of creating a profile. If you create the profile, when you save the map, it saves it to your profile. So it does remember the map extent, it remembers the layers that you had turned on, and it's saved to your profile where only you can delete it and only you can see it. So the answer is yes. Is any customization or bootstrap like add-on needed to present these many window pop-ups in a mobile version? I don't, don't want to mislead you. This is the desktop version that is really only works on the desktop. I showed a couple screenshots of the mobile app and it is, it's far from PG Atlas. It's very light. It's just got the assessment data and some zoning information and it does not show PDF links and all of that. No, 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 no. It's, it's very limited. Just, I mean, you're, you're getting to the point. The bandwidth required to support this is not there. Thank you. Recent dialogue in ERISA has focused on surveys, GIS roles, slash GIS roles and responsibilities. Do you disclaim your boundaries in any way? And has this app caused any contention in PG with the land survey community? Oh, great question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me see if I can share my screen here. I got out. Um, stop sharing. Am I sharing it right now? Can you see it? Yeah. You can see this on my disclaimer? Is it a blue? Is no, I'm, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'll turn that off. Um, you stop sharing and reshare one second. Hmm. Well, I'll do it this way. Can you see that? Yes. You see the disclaimer? I can, yes. Okay. So the question was, do we put a disclaimer on the map? Absolutely. Uh, if you remember, we started the property base map by scanning in the mylars. Those mylars were far from being coordinate geometry anything. They were cartoon at best. So as we, as we grow, I'm sorry, as in 1993, it was a replica of the mylars as property lines. Now, when you turn on the aerial imagery, you could see some shifts going on. So automatically you knew something was wrong. Over time, over the 20 years of future development and enhancements, just to drop in a new subdivision plat into that property boundary required you to fix a lot of the property boundaries around it just to get the new correct one in. So we are court, we are using Kogo. We actually go in and drop in new subdivisions, but then it forces you to tweak around the edges. So here's our disclaimer. And I would say South County down here, if you can see my mouse, this is all original mylars, there hasn't been a lot of development. You remember the orange map of undeveloped lands? All of that's suspect. And you turn on the property lines, it's close, it's very good, but it's not engineer accurate. Now, back to the, the question that was kind of hinted at. Um, we are not surveyors. We, we use uh, the engineering drawings to capture the boundaries as best we can. We're not certified engineers and we drop the line work in, and that's our legal disclaimer saying, a lot of these are good. I, what I say is, year 2000 forward, any new plat is really good. Will I certify it? No. Will I go to a court and certify it? No. But it is the best that we have, um, full stop. Very good. I don't see any other questions. Lots of good feedback though for you guys. Yes. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have Michael and Jason and the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission share your work. Thank you for your time and submitting your application in the first place well over a year ago now. And thanks to everyone for attending today. Check out the links in the chat. Any final words, Michael, Jason or Wendy? I would be happy to help anybody with future conversations about building something this complex. Um, I. You know, I've got a lot of years of lessons learned. Um, there's a lot of new technology coming. We're, we're trying to figure out how all this is going to tie 3D buildings on a map. I mean, there's it. So if you need, if you want some advice, you know, send me an email. Excellent. Thank you.
Great information. Thank you all so much.